Detective Joseph Giuliano and Yolanda Silvera, true heroes among us, both in your own right and for different reasons. It's an honor to have you both here with me today to share your story in person and to be a witness to the extraordinary story and the extraordinary journey that Yolanda, you have undergone um, with the help of Detective Joe Giuliano. Let's start, please. Detective, tell us what happened on the night of July 8th, 2006 in Newark, New Jersey. Um, well, actually, um, I was employed by East Orange and the incident occurred in East Orange, uh, New Jersey at first and then spanned out through multiple jurisdictions throughout the course of the investigation. So on that time, we got a call that there was a, uh, a carjacking and a male was seen running in a nearby park stripped of his clothing. And it was learned that uh, Yolanda and her friend were sitting in a car and they were approached by the gentleman later identified as Noah Cuevas, who came up uh, upon them, tapped on the window and entered the vehicle, pistol whipped the gentleman, carjacked the, the vehicle with them both in it, kidnapping them and kicked the gentleman out in the park after telling him to remove his clothes. And then he then proceeded in the vehicle to drive with Yolanda into the city of Newark, which was a neighboring town. And what happened then, Detective? Well, she, during during the course, while well, she uh, he had her, he sexually assaulted her and uh, shot her in the head with a forty five caliber pistol that he had on him, and left her for dead in the church parking lot, where someone walking his dog the next morning found the car running with her in it. And, and so uh, the call first went out for a carjacking. You received the call at that time. At what point did you directly inherit this violent case? Well, the carjacking came in the night before. And then when the vehicle was located a couple hours later, then that's when this all started to unravel. Um, when Yolanda was was discovered, the North police actually called the Essex County Prosecutor's Homicide Unit because they thought at that point she had been deceased. But she she was not. She did. She had a, a, a slight pulse, and ultimately, as you see here, she's she's not deceased. Mm -hmm. So throughout, um, after she was brought to the hospital, then we did a a, a series of interviews and canvas in the area, and that's how we developed the suspect, uh, Noah Cuevas, going back to the original original scene of the crime. Um, Yolanda obviously was in a coma for uh, several months, so at that at that time she was of she could not help us with the investigation. The gentleman she was with was quickly the next day dismissed as not having any involvement and that this was an apparent stranger to him. So after the incident, we just start canvassing the area and everything. And we went to the original building that it, it happened at and knocking on doors and everything. We met a gentleman in there and uh, we were just talking to them. And no one, as, as you know, no one wants to give information. So while walking out, I said, if you knew anyone in the building who would know anything, what's going on? So they directed us to the, someone in the building that that was a problem. So we went to that gentleman and interviewed him. And again, reluctant to speak and everything like that. And we told him of the situation we were investigating and everything. And he didn't know anything about it. And we said, uh, well, you know, do you know anything? What's going on in the city, town? Has anyone been trying to sell a watch? This was now the next day or day after. And he goes, yes, my friend happened to just buy a watch on Central Avenue in East Orange. So we then contacted that friend who bought a watch from this other gentleman they knew. And that watch was identified as proceeds taking the original robbery that Yolanda's friend was wearing at the time of the incident. So we then linked that stolen watch to the suspect, Noah. And that's how we were able to put warrants for his arrest for receiving stolen property. Throughout the course of the week investigation, he was tracked down with the help of the FBI, Gary Beneducci, and he was located in Middlesex County, New Jersey, and transported to the local police department, where we then picked him up and took over the, the, the interviewing process, the investigation. But that's how uh, we ended up tracking him down, through the watch that was stolen at the time of incident was resold to someone else in the neighborhood, and that's how, that's how we ended up, ended up finding the suspect. And upon apprehending him, you discovered that he had been responsible for a series of brutal murders. 
Yeah, at this at this point, we obviously were 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 quite sure who that this was was our, our suspect. A from the watch, from interviewing uh, his family members, from um, seeing some surveillance video that you know going back that long ago was a little blurry. But once you have someone identified, you could you could tell who they are and his clothing and everything like that. So when the FBI picked him up, we were not there at the time that they picked him up. They picked him up on a Sunday. This all concluded in ten days. This investigation. Uh, took place spanning out through uh, East Orange and Newark and with the help of the FBI and tracking him down. Uh, took about three or four days they found him in Middlesex. So when me and my partner, Detective Richie Acosta, we went to go pick him up at the local PD and we get him in the car and I'm sitting in the back with him and we're driving to the East Orange Police Precinct and he asked me who we were. And I said, you don't know who we are? He said, no. I said, well, I'm Detective Giuliano and we're going to put you in prison for the rest of your life. And he said, well, why do you want to do that? I said, because we know what you did and we'll discuss mm -hmm. it shortly. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there was no conversation until we got down to East Orange Police Headquarters. As we get him into the interview room, East Orange Police Headquarters, Detective uh, Rich Acosta, my partner, Detective Sergeant Josiah Reynolds and myself was there. He asked for me to please be removed from the room. He said he didn't feel comfortable speaking with me in the room. So I was sitting outside observing. As I'm observing, Detective Acosta and Josiah Reynolds are explaining the whole, uh, are interviewing and speaking to him. He's not speaking of this incident with Yolanda. He's just off in the weeds speaking about other stuff. And he's telling a story of how, I don't even know why he wanted to bring this up, but he was telling a story how he met um, a young lady, um, if I may, uh, Shawanda Hutchins, who was 14 at the time. And he met her and was walking with her and walked her at gunpoint to a vacant building where he then sexually assaulted her and shot her in the head as well. And when he did shoot her, one of the, the rounds jammed in the gun. So he had to re-rack it and a live round was spent. Coincidentally, my partner at the time was the patrol officer that took that report from, from back. So he knew that this was a verified story. No one else would know about a live round because the gun jammed, but that's how in detail he was to say the gun jammed, I racked it, the live round fell out. So as they're talking, Detective Acosta is kind of nudging my sergeant saying, this is legit. This is legit. So now as they start talking about that more, he, he just gives in-depth detail how he tortured her verbally, saying what he was going to do to her and kill her and just how, how he enjoyed it and just she let let it. her know that he was going to rape, kill, and shoot her. And unfortunately, that is how that young 14-year-old female's life ended in the vacant building basement on South Harrison Street in East Orange. That was uh, just one of the heinous acts. He then also, just talking again, he would not bring up this situation with Yolanda, but was willing to talk about other stuff, where he talked about a year and a half prior, he uh, encountered a young gentleman, please let me get his name, respect as well, Alan Reese, who that was in 2005. In 2005, Noah Cuevas uh, robbed and shot and tortured him verbally as well, making him plea for his life and shot him to steal the cell phone of Alan Reese. When he had the cell phone, the suspect now, he would then text there was no locks on the phone at that time. So 17 years ago, 18 years ago, he would text family members and and the grandmother and the brother of the decedent who he just killed saying, I'm speaking to you from the grave. Um, I hope you're wearing black. He actually went to the funeral services of Alan Reese and the family said they now so after court and seeing him, they say we saw him at the funeral. He went there. So he taunted them and actually led his brother to where his he killed his brother behind a vacant building in Newark in the Valesburg section. So that is just uh, you know, two of the incidents that he just was had pleasure speaking about and, and, and held nothing back. And, and then those two incidents led up to this incident in July of 2006, when unfortunately Yolanda and her friend were in the wrong place at the wrong time where this gentleman was... Uh, praying. He was living in the building that they were in front of. Oh, yeah? He was living with his, he was staying with his sister. He was just released mm. from prison 
uh, like a month or two months b b before. So he was staying with the, the sister and the brother-in-law. And the brother-in-law said, he goes, the, the man terrifies me, terrifies me. Oh. And we recovered the bloody clothing that he was wearing, the army jacket and everything in his sister's apartment. Unknowing the sister and brother-in-law had nothing to do with it. They just had this psychopath. You know, they, they, she she was if she had no choice but to let him stay there because she was terrified of him. So if she like if I don't let him stay, what happens? What does he do mm -hmm. to us? If we do let him stay, what happens to us? So they were they were in a, in a very bad they were in a bad situation as well. But that is what le uh, led this and uh, up to us. And this as as they're interviewing him, he's just giving uh, a plethora of stuff uh, that he did as far as shooting someone in the face and throwing him out the second floor window in. In uh, Orange, he did a carjacking on the mm -hmm. parkway. He, uh, he, there was a couple other, he, he, he did say, he said, he goes, I've been killing people since I'm 14. I don't know how many people I've killed, is what he said. And he later on went on to say that everything I gave you was for, um, was for fun, not for work. Because he was a, a hired hit person through both gang members, uh, Bloods, Crips, whoever it was. If you needed someone dead, you called, you contacted Noah Quavis, and he would he would kill on command. And that is that is the type of person we put away for for life. And right? what was and what was the disposition of that case, detective? Um, he saw. He somehow beat one of the carjackings. I'm not. I'm not sure. He. I, I think actually technically he beat. Your carjacking, I'm not sure, but uh, the disposition was he, he pleaded to the he pleaded to a carjacking, the sexual assault, the the shooting, um, the obviously the murder of of, of a Shawanda and Allen. So I believe the total sentencing time was life plus 200 years was the exact uh, without the possibility of parole. without the possibility of of parole. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yolanda was able to testify there. Went from, you know, calling the homicide unit, not thinking she was alive to be able to testify in her own trial, which she's the one that put him away. We connected the dots, mm -hmm. but she put him away. And this whole thing is a great tribute to law enforcement and how we all work together and everything. But this is the Yolanda Silvera story. This isn't the, the cop story. So, she's Yolanda, now that we have the X's and O's by the detective, mm -hmm. what did it mean for you to be able to testify at that trial to be able to put away this monster that had Listen, gone I, for so many years. Because he could have done this to many multiple people if I didn't. And that's what I felt. If I didn't put him away, then he probably would be still out here mm -hmm. doing what he did to me. And I didn't want that. So I went to testify. At first, I was afraid to do so. Because I thought that some of his friends were retaliating on me because he told me he was a blood, a gang member. But, but you, I had no courage to do it. And because of your bravery and overcoming that fear, the fear of retaliation, as you said, you testified, and no doubt he would still be doing that same thing on the streets. He said that. He admitted as such when the detective picked him up, he would be continuing that horrific pattern. Yolanda, it's been almost 20 years, and your bravery and your absolute miraculous recovery, you said there, there's a higher power than the doctors. The doctor said you wouldn't walk again. You are walking today. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Yes. In 2010, I had two surgeries. The first surgery I had was to replace the bone they took out of my head. They had to remove a piece of my skull mm. because my brain was swollen. And then four years later, I got the, another surgery to replace that. And then I forgot what the fun was. <laughs> oh, and then uh, after that, my surgery I had on my ankle is what gave me the leeway to walk mm -hmm. because I had dropped foot 
shock when it can go down and the bone gets stuck. Mm. But after that surgery, I took my first steps and I was so happy because my goal was to walk out of that nursing home. I said to myself, the minute I go in there, I might be rolling here today, but later on, I don't know when or how, I'm going to walk out of this nursing home. And that was my goal. And I worked so hard to get to that point. Such a testament of your willpower, of your faith. You said before, when the doctor said you couldn't walk again, you, you knew there was a higher power. You knew you would prove them wrong. And before this interview, I heard um, your friend say in the background that the first media interview you gave was from a nursing home. And now you have your own apartment, independence. What does that mean for you? Well, it means a lot to me because looking back at how far I came mm -hmm. and how far I'm going is amazing to myself because there's many out there that lose hope and lost hope in my same predicament. But I'm glad to be an inspiration to many. Mm -hmm. I encourage so many people. I know I did because there was a, my girlfriend. She was afraid of going through things, and I had to tell her, listen, so I can do it, you can do it too. You just have to put your faith where on. That's right. Can you share about your family? My son was five years old when it happened to me. And he now, for well, some years even, you know, just going through a lot. He didn't know what to think. As a child, it was traumatizing to him for him. Your mom in the hospital? No, my son. I had a sick baby in the hospital at that time, who later passed away. But I didn't know when he first passed away because my mother, she didn't want me to know until I got a little better. You shared before that while you were fighting for your life in your coma and after that you could hear the conversations in the hotel room, I mean in the hospital room. Um, yeah. Can you share a little bit about what you heard and how that impacted your will to survive? Well, I heard the family, uh, you know, have a conversation with the doctor when the doctor was telling them that I wouldn't make it, that if I did make it, I would live like a vegetable. Mm -hmm. And I guess I knew that I couldn't speak on it, but in my heart, I guess I knew that because here I am today. Mm -hmm. My son father was there for me, even though we weren't together. My family was there for me. You know, when you're in a coma, you can't hear. But that's all you can do is hear. You don't have functioning in the rest of your body, but you can hear. Because I heard everything. I heard my mother and my aunt saying, I used to hear me squeeze my finger, and I squeezed their fingers. I squeezed it so tight. My son, oh my son, my son's father, he told me he came into the room, was talking to me, and I opened my eyes. Mind you, the doctor said I was brain dead. If I was brain dead, how can I open my eyes? Mm -hmm. Cranial nerves in the back of your brain. We have 12 cranial nerves that come in pairs, and they're all in the back of your brain. So how can I be brain dead if some cranial nerves are working? Those cranial nerves send signals to do the functioning of the body. When you were squeezing your, your mom's hand and opening your eyes, um, was that your brain telling your body to do that? And did your did your mom feel you do that? Or yeah. at that time you were hearing it and you were you were feeling like you were giving that sensation, but she wasn't 
feeling that in your body? Yeah, she was telling me because she told me. She also said that I was crying while I was doing it. Mm. So I have feelings also. Yeah. Brain damage. When you're brain dead, nothing is working. So what the doctor said to my family, I don't understand why they told them that. Part of what I... Of my damage to the brain. And I also learned that the brain pop multiple vessels in my brain. Part of what I find so remarkable about your incredible will to survive after the event, um, it includes during the event, that when you were kidnapped by um, that I'm monster, not- that you said, you, you told him you were a mother, you you cooperated you were you stayed calm you did everything right that whole evening um Mm -hmm. and you engaged in everything that could protect yourself and at that at that point your children you you kept them in mind and kept them in the forefront so that you could survive and come home to them which you did you did Mm -hmm. yeah what's your recovery like now um, are there goals that you have at this moment that you are working toward in physical therapy at all? Yes, I get physical therapy. Mm-hmm. And I get occupational therapy. Mm-hmm. I was doing cognitive therapy. You know, it's pretty memory. Yeah. I still have to work on that. But my goal is to walk without my cane. I'm walking with a cane. Mm. I graduated three times. At first, I started with the Henry Walker. That's a cane that has longer, longer, uh, what do you call it, poles. Mm-hmm. For people that don't have enough balance. But after that, I went to a quiet cane with shorter poles. And now uh, today, I walk with street cane. It's such phenomenal recovery. It represents such um, just such incredible strides and measures from being told that you were brain dead, from being told you wouldn't wake up. As you said, of, of course you were alive. Of course you heard everything and you knew in that moment you would walk again, you would wake up to the rest of the world and now you've, you are mobile and you're getting through these goals one by one by one steadily. Um, you're nothing short of impressive, amazing, and, and brave. It's it's really an honor to have you share your story with us in this way as well. Detective, as you sit next to Yolanda now and, and appreciating, again, these incredible measures of recovery that she has undergone, this almost 20 years representing of her commitment to life, commitment to living life fully, um, crediting faith, inspiring others in all of those ways, what does it mean for you? I mean, it's, it, it's just... Truly remarkable of, mm-hmm. of what she does and, and the accomplishments she's made and how far she's come. I mean, in this day and age, you see you know, suicide is basically an epidemic these days. Everyone is, it's crazy that people mm-hmm. are just taking their lives. Where here is someone who they thought her life was gone and she she keeps going and going and going. And the thing that we, you know, normal people stress over and think is the worst day possible and what can go wrong and who's got a pimple, who's having a bad hair day. And here's someone who just, you know, keeps battling uphill, 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 and just never looks back. And she, you know, she, she thanks God for what she has now and what she's going to have in the future where, where, you know, people that are perfectly healthy are talking about the negative where here she's speaking about the positive. I, I, I can't even fathom or imagine the, the whole circumstance on her end of her family's end of how just from, from just sitting in a car innocently after leaving a diner and chatting, um, you know, and waking up months and months and to years later into the hospital. And like she said, finding out her, her, her young infant child passed away during that time, which she wasn't able to, to, to attend. She, she lost so much. And, and these are her words that, you know, he, he took her life. He just didn't kill her. Mm. And that, those are, those are Yolanda's words. Those are strong words. Mm-hmm. Those are very strong words because 
he did take her life, and he took life of 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 many, many a few that we know, and that means probably many more. But uh, you know, at least we did. You know, we also saved lives uh, by 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 taking him. You know, and putting him where he belongs. Unfortunately, the last stop on his on his uh, terror was was Yolanda. A hundred percent. Yolanda saved so many lives by that testimony, by surviving that night and being able to live to testify all of those events um, that impacted her, that led to him being finally put away behind bars with zero possibility of parole, especially in the criminal justice system and in especially in current times. That can be a difficult bar to cross and a difficult um, measure to, to achieve. Yolanda, when you hear the detective talking about that um what message do you have for others listening? Well, he did. He didn't do it to me. He did it for me. He says, now I look at life in a different way. That's amazing. I'm so grateful to you both. Thank you for honoring me with sharing this story. Thank you for getting this monster off the street, Detective, and Yolanda for your bravery and testifying and for being every day a representative and angel, a true hero and warrior, really. To his point, you are representing life, full life and full faith. And um, you've blessed me today. I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you both. Thank you for the opportunity and the opportunity once again for Yolanda to tell her story. And thank you for the work you do with law enforcement and veterans mm -hmm. and everything. It is uh, it's greatly, greatly appreciated.